Mm-hmm. Um, and so sometimes, yeah, I've, I've gone from making, you know, over hundred K a month to then making only a couple of grand in the month. Yep. Welcome back everybody to be the trader today. I have a return guest, a special guest. He's been on the show, I believe maybe once or twice. His name's Kyle Williams. And when he came on the show a while back, it was before he hit a big milestone and he's back today because he crossed a big milestone, crossed a million dollars in trading profits. And I wanted to bring him on just to catch up with him, see how things have been, see how he did it, and pretty much give you an insight of where he is right now. So Kyle, thank you for being here, my man. What's going on? Thanks for having me back. It's been it's been a long time. It's been very long. <laughs> it's been a long time, brother. I'm, I'm so glad to have you back here. I'd like to start off by just really finding out, did it, did it feel any different? Like, did you have to make any drastic changes to get to work, to cross that million dollar profit? Like, did you face anything that was really hard at some point getting closer to that number? Or, or was it just from the beginning to the end, the same thing every day? Um, the, the, yeah, the day of approaching it, I mean, from a psychological standpoint, like same thing with PDT, uh, when I crossed that, like there definitely was a barrier, like, Oh, this is a number, you know, it's coming. Um, but then, but also at the same time, I had been doing it for over four years at that point. So uh, I, I did the day I thought about it, I did blow right through it. Um, so it wasn't that big of a deal, but it definitely is like, it was in my brain for sure. Um, but in terms of like the whole journey, um, I would say what you said, like the same thing every day, you know, after once I found my process and what works for me, you know, it's, it's the same setups, the same trade plans, um, same mentality. Uh, and just, yeah, same thing every day, you know, do you feel like there's ever a different challenge every time you try to size up? Like, do you think there's like maybe a new psychological challenge temporarily? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, that's probably my biggest challenge always, like even right now, um, I'll say like I crossed my journey and then specifically in August, um, throughout my journey, I found that I, I have trouble sizing up. Um, even if my account's bigger, like my account will get bigger and I'll risk a certain percentage of my account. Um, but even then it still gets psychologically tougher, um, yeah. because there's still real world money at, at, on the line. Um, and of course there's like how I view my trading money and then how I view my rural money. And that kind of conflicts with itself. Cause I'm like, wow, that's a lot of money on my screen. That's could, could translate into something, you know, in real, or in the real world life. Um, so that's always been a struggle. I think what usually pushes me to then take that next bigger risk and push myself. And then ultimately like kind of find a new baseline that's much higher is when we hit like hot, hot markets. So going into um, late 2019, early 2020, uh, I don't think I was risking more than like a thousand bucks for trade. I felt super antsy and uncomfortable if I got over that number. And then of course, if anyone traded during that time, you know, March, 2020 hit, whole world went on lockdown. uh, And then we just got dozens and dozens of plays. Um, You know, like at one point, what was it? three stocks were under the NASDAQ were under a dollar. I mean, that's how insane it got. So when that happened, it was, it almost like, instead of me having to push myself to take bigger size, it almost pulled me. Whereas like, there are so many good plays. There's so many plays I know super well and are super convicted with that. I can't not try to take advantage and push myself or it's pulling me in to take bigger size. And then, so once that happened, it kind of set a new baseline. Like, Oh, okay. I can handle this size of loss or, okay. I can handle this amount of dollar position on a, on a, on a stock. Um, and I found that to be the case every single hot market. Um, so then coming into this August, you know, we haven't been, we haven't been slow, but we've obviously been slower from like the peak we had in February and March. And so since a little bit of last month, and especially this month so far to start, I found myself very timid, um, sizing down, taking way less risk. And it's not a bad thing. Like you definitely want to modulate during hot and slow markets, but I've definitely have felt like I've maybe gone a little bit below my previous baseline, just from being a more timid standpoint. Um, which is okay. But in some way, in some respects, when I see a trade, that's really, really good. I'm not pushing it as much as I should. Um, mm-hmm. but then I also, again, back to the whole bigger picture thing. I also realize whenever the next market comes, whether it be next month, six months from now, next year from now, I know I will, I'll, it's like muscle memory. I'll get right back to where I need to go or, you know, so I don't, I'm not uncomfortable or unsure of myself going forward. It's just how I modulate and have to kind of react where I'm at in any given market. It's interesting that you say that because you're constantly adjusting your risk Mm -hmm. even now and you're comfortable setting, you know, stepping, taking a couple steps back, depending Mm -hmm. on what the market has given you. And a lot of people don't understand that. Like they think you're going to be trading this size forever. And it's, if you modulate and go backwards, 
then you're technically going backwards. And I right, think right. I think you just made a good example of that that's not really the case. You're just trying to make sure you're attacking the market with the right size, with the right opportunities. Because not every opportunity deserves the bigger size risk, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um I totally get what you mean because I know a lot of people will feel that way about like they're going back. Um, but I think it's very counterintuitive where you might think, okay, no, I want to only go forward. So I'm going to keep my size even when the market slows down. But when the market slows down, usually your win rate goes down. Usually you don't even see as many setups, which also can cause you to like overtrade and um, and just take setups that aren't there. And so if you're taking that same size, your losses will be much more rampant and probably much bigger um, than they need to be. And so for me, something I'm really, really, I guess maybe you could say take pride in is that when the market gets slow, um, I may not make as much profits, but I've stayed, you know, knock on wood, you know, stayed green probably you think for coming up on like four years, every month, at least on a monthly basis. So I've, I've read days, I have read weeks, um, but I've really done very well at modulating when I'm slow month, so maybe slower. Mm-hmm. Um, and so sometimes, yeah, I've, I've gone from making, you know, over hundred K a month to then making only a couple of grand in the month. Yep. Um, yep. But I've stayed green. And I think that's, you know, in some ways I might play, I might be playing too defensive, but in a lot of ways I, I keep that at least somewhat consistency. I'm not like super green or super red on a larger scale, month to month, quarter to quarter, you know, half a year basis, kind of like that. So, and and but I want to ask you this, so because there's people who are currently dealing with trying to size up over time, right? Mm-hmm. They try to size up. Do you? I know you said that you risk a percentage of your account, but right. at some point you also mentioned that you were comfortable with a thousand, and so you got comfortable with it, even though your account grew, you probably didn't increase your risk, even though one percent was bigger, right? Right. So. Right. How do you suggest to people to slowly grow? Like if maybe they're dealing with that challenge where they're mm-hmm. like, I'm stuck at a thousand right now. My account's bigger, but I, I can't risk 1% because I'm just not used to losing real world money of 15, 200, $2,000, $3,000 right, right. for a trade. Is there a way that you have found that really helps you besides the market pulling you mm-hmm. to, to increase that has helped you increase gradually? Like, is there a system or some kind of process you personally do for yourself when you do want to increase? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, right, because I, I, that's kind of what led me to, right, having that market pull me because I did the same thing where my account, even, even right now, I can see my, how big my account is. I am not risking 1% per trade, uh, not at all, not even close. Um, so in some respects, you can ask like, well, why don't I wire out? Um, and, it, and specifically, it's for those reasons what, when the market gets hot, I am then pulled and I want that dollar size in my account. Um, but in terms of not pulling the market or the market not pulling me, um, I would take very incremental steps. So like, let's go back to that $1,000 example. Um, so it, normally if it was like 1%, I should be risking a thousand bucks on a hundred thousand dollar account. And like you said, say I go to 200,000 and it should be two grand, but I'm not risking that. Um, I might then incrementally kind of try to get to 2000. So maybe like for one week or two weeks or maybe even a month, if I want to go slower. I will try to be like, just do 1100, a hundred bucks more, mm-hmm. like just slowly. And then kind of remember, kind of create that new baseline in your brain psychologically of like, I can handle a hundred dollars more. Mm-hmm. I can handle $200 more, you know, three. And then after a few months, few weeks, all of a sudden, okay, I have a new baseline slowly. Um, and I would do that all the time where I found myself maybe earlier on in my journey or my career where I would get very scared to take a trade and I didn't know why. And then in hindsight, I'd reflect and be like, okay, I, I was, I didn't even know my risk. I was like, I was so I was so stagnant or so hesitant and I had never taken the time to be like, okay, what am, what am I risking? Right. Cause if I'm risking, if I just logically put on a brain, like, okay, what if I risk $500 on this trade? I can risk that much. And then all of a sudden you actually start having a position size in mind and you can take the trade. Um, there's many times where I've, like I said, I've been stagnant cause I'm too busy caught up in if I should take the trade yeah. because I haven't even thought about the dollar amount I'm okay willing to lose. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think really kind of being conscious of that and be like, okay, I'm used to a thousand. Can I handle 1100? Yes. And you just do that for a week, two weeks, three weeks. You know, I usually did in the beginning, I usually did for like a month. And if I traded well that month, if I handled that new increase, that risk for a month, okay, let's do 1200. Let's do 1300. Um, okay. That's how I got about it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Cause that's a slow process, but it takes your mm-hmm. time and you get comfortable with it. And yeah. I think too many people, and I'm sure you hear this get DMS just like I do where they're like, I'm trying to increase it to 1500 from a thousand and then to 2000 to 3000. Right, and I right. think people don't realize that every level you increase this is a challenge I deal with currently because I'm just slowly trying to increase over time Mm -hmm. that every time you increase, you face a new level of psychological barriers. It's the same barriers you faced when you first were consistent and you slowly, you know, from a hundred to 200 to 300, 
but every time you increase it multiplies that barrier mm-hmm. and that's a challenge that I'm, i deal with and and the way i handle it is similar to what you said i slowly increase it to where it doesn't really affect me mentally mm-hmm. and it kind of just becomes a new norm over right. time that's mm-hmm. cool man i you know i want to ask you something because you're training bigger now and more mm-hmm. in most cases bigger account you have to take in a big loss like a big loss that you weren't used to Right. And I don't mean used to as in maybe it is the case, but I don't mean like gigantic percentage drawdown in one trade. Maybe that happened if it did great. Not great, but like explain. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying just a bigger psychological loss that really impacted you in a different way. How do you handle that now? Like if you if you're hit with some kind of loss, has that happened? I mean, has it even happened? Um, That's a good point. That's a good question. Cause so I'll think of two. Um, one was very early on, and one was very recent earlier this year. Um, one of them, the, re- the one that was recent this year, was very was the biggest loss ever. I'll go over that after a second, but it was okay. very non psychologically impactful, and I'll re- explain why. So the first one that was the most impactful that I felt like I was felt like I was going to puke um, was when I was only up maybe like forty grand in profits or so, maybe thirty or forty. For the week and month, I was short. Um, I was short an OTC promotion, uh, and I got and, and that that strategy revolves around having to sh- swing some of these OTCs short for two, three, four weeks a month, um, and so a risk of that is getting bought in by your broker. I had gotten bought in um, like near the top of the whole promotion, and so I had lost four grand on this trade. Um, now I mean, maybe it was like three grand, close to maybe low three hundreds. Uh, but it was like 10% of my overall count, a much bigger percentage loss than I'm right. If I'm literally only, wish, I'm only, you know, normally I'm only risking one to 2%. I mean, this was 10. I was already a little bit too big over my head. Um, again, I was much earlier in my journey, still hadn't figured out the kinks. So I got bought in and there's a huge hit to my, my stomach. Um, huge hit. Like I thought I was going to puke. I thought I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to recover? Um, and I think what got me through that was knowing was having the perspective. Okay. I lost close to three to four grand, but I, I literally started trading with like three to four grand. I started with trading with six grand in my account, but the biggest, the, my biggest drawdown in the first year of trading, I lost like 70% of that account, lost four grand of that account down to like 2,300, 1700, um, around there. Uh, and so the fact that I just realized I lost the perspective I had was I lost about 4k up to 4k over a year of trading my first year. And I just lost it in a in a one buy-in today, and I still have ninety percent of my account left. Now that doesn't mean oh, let's just go one hundred percent and let's just you know that <laughs> yeah. wasn't what I'm saying, what I'm thinking. But I'm like that perspective of of look how far I've come, mm. right? Yes, I took a big hit, the biggest hit percent wise I've ever had at that time, but I'm still hundreds of percent above where my account started. Um, so that was very encouraging and motivating to have that perspective and know I can keep going, which I obviously did. Um, the second biggest loss, well, is still my biggest loss, but was way less emotionally impactful was a MMNFF back in February. This was the day that Tilray got crushed. All the wheat stocks just had their huge run, got crushed. MMNFF was a dip buy. I was trying to panic dip buy it. Um, and I mean, it's more embarrassing than emotionally damaging for this trade because I mean, I threw out every rule, uh, no risk management, no trade plan. Um, literally, I mean, I, I had never gone in bigger dollar wise at the time than I had in this trade. Cause I was so obsessed with like making this stock bounce, which mm-hmm. is ridiculous. I can't, I'm not big enough to move a market. Like I just, but I just went, I mean, Kyle wasn't there that day. He didn't, I've never even come close to how I acted that day before or after. I mean, this, I, someone else showed up for trading that day. And I, I literally just kept buying and kept buying and kept buying. Um, finally late day reality set in. I'm like, this thing isn't going to go up. I need to, I need to cut or else it's going to get much, much worse. And so I sold losing like 90 K. Um, and that's my biggest loss by like five X or three X now, I think. Um, so, so why wasn't that not more emotionally damaging? Well, again, perspective wise, I, even, even after, I mean, February was so insane. Even after that biggest loss, I was still up my new biggest week. Like that's how much, right. So it's like, <laughs> I can't be boohoo, poor me. It's like, it, it was, it was still a learning experience. I was like, wow, I need to really hunker down and like get back to my rules. Cause I just broke every single one in the book. Um, 
But again, perspective wise, like, okay, I, I lost yesterday's profits. <laughs> you know, that's kind of how it was that in that yeah. week at least. So it was just crazy. Um, and have I done anything close to, since that? Not even remotely close. Like that, that really reset me good. Um, and, and yeah, so I haven't been anywhere close to that kind of a loss since. So, so traders face that similar situation that you just talked about, but the difference between how you handle it, first off, you said, I don't know who that was. That wasn't me. And then obviously you took care of that the next day and started trading mm -hmm. properly. Mm -hmm. What did you do? Because a lot of traders, a lot of them, I actually was talking to one one-on-one -on -one earlier today because he hit his max loss and, and he, I could see it going in this direction because he was breaking a lot of rules, but he was making money. I was like, hey, be careful, man. Like, mm -hmm. you don't want to do this. And you broke a lot of rules that day and ended up taking a big loss for it, but were able to revert back, even though you were like, hey, I, this is like a big loss, but... I'm making a lot of money this week. So it doesn't really affect me. A lot of people would see that too, but mm -hmm. not see it and correct it. Can you talk about how dangerous that can be? Cause you can easily just like yeah. be like spiral and go down mm -hmm. the wrong way. And you could have told me a whole different story today. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think why this, this was the case for this very specific reason was that the hot market that we were in, in kind of late December, January, February, there were a lot of panic dip buys, specifically in like the OTC market, which is a setup I really, really love, which was which was the plan ori originally on MMNFF. So all throughout January, February, even a little bit of December, these dip buys were working really, really well. And in a lot of instances, there were times where they might not have, they, they adapt, you know, setups, setups can like adapt in markets. They can still be the same like outline, but how they do it in that minute to minute basis is different. And so a couple of ways that they changed were that like sometimes they'd have one fake out where it's like they panic, I try to dip by them and normally they'd work. In this market, they panic, small bounce or kind of almost like a fake out, go one, like a percent or two lower to where it was like anyone who's cutting is selling the bottom and then they would rip, right? So it was like the, it was that adaptation where so a lot of these times when I started making a lot of money was I adapted. I said, okay, I'm gonna buy a little bit on the first dip. If it bounces, great, I'll sell it. But if it makes a new low and then bottoms again, I'm going to really load up and then it rips. And I mean, that it was so weird. That became like such a consistent thing for those two months where like the panic dip buy is what made me cross a million dollars in profits, like that, that exact setup. So I really had adapted to that well. And a part of me knowing how that setup should have been, where it, it should have, I should be cutting it, right? The three years prior is like, you always cut it on that new low or you at least try to. Um, I had a feeling like when this reverts back, in the back of my head, I kind of knew it. I was like, when this reverts back and changes, I'm going to get hurt on one of them. And, and my justification was, okay, well, I'm killing it right now. That one bad loss shouldn't, shouldn't be as much as, as, as all the profits I'm making, which was the, which is what happened. Um, but the reason why you say that, why I'm trying to answer the question is like, yeah. how did that, how did you avoid that from, how do you adapt so quickly? It was like, well, the back of my head, I kind of already knew. Yeah. And so when it happened, I'm like, this is it. Like, this is the, this is where, this is where I go back. Cause this is where it ends. And kind of, it, it did end. Like after that day, everyone was reminded of how dip buys don't have to bounce and how you can get crushed. And I was like, yep, this is, this is the sign. So I kind of, I already knew I was like, I just, it was a matter of time for it to hit me and ha have it happen. That's, ex that's experience. That's what that is. It's like, you, you've known beforehand, like you were adapting mm -hmm. to the market. You said a, a lot of great things. Like you, you were planning that this will happen one day because you adapted to a situation that started to change within the setup itself. Yep. And the fact that you said that, a lot of people don't understand that. Like a setup will always change, but the core of it is still the same. Mm -hmm. And how it changes is just because there's other people in the market, other people buy differently, get scared differently. Maybe the market makers, whoever they may be, are, are changing things up. And you adapt with that, but while you're adapting, you understand like, hey, you know, I'm taking a risk here. And that, I think that's why you were able, like you just said, you were able to immediately switch back to like, okay, this was a day I was ready for it mentally. And that's probably why it even hurt you mentally, besides the fact that you did well already. But mm -hmm. I think mentally, that's why it also didn't hurt you because you were prepared for that because you knew right. it was going to happen at one point. Um, so I'm, I'm happy you said that. Let me ask you this though, because you mentioned... You, you mentioned a while back, you say, when I, when I first started, you know, 40K, I lost 3K. It was really, really mentally jarring you know, in terms of percentages, but then you put things in perspective. And when you said you put things in perspective, it kind of hit a light bulb for me because I think that's something a lot of good traders do is that they tend to, yes, they learn the lesson, but they don't beat themselves up. 
And instead of you just really beating yourself up, unless you did, you know, let me know. But it sounded like you like obviously got upset for a while, but then you also explained to yourself why you should be happy, why you should be happy with this moment and how you are thankful for where you are. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something you just highlighted that people don't understand that they, in other words, they, they make a mistake and they just kick themselves over and over and over and over. And then they don't grow. Can, mm-hmm. can you hit on that for a moment? Yeah, that's a, that's, I, I love that you said that. Cause I, it made me, as you're asking, I really thought about that difference. I, I see, I see there's two ways to beat yourself up. One is negatively and the other is positively. So negatively beating yourself up um, is both are habits, right? So both you have to kind of just grow a habit into it. But a lot of people, it's very easy for your brain and you to grow a negative habit in terms of like, so beating yourself up. I'm stupid. That was dumb. Why would you do something so idiotic? It's so like that doesn't help you, right? You were just, you're just calling yourself names. Like I, I said this um, in, uh, in my, I did a, a speech at 2019. Actually just, I just posted on YouTube um, my 2019 uh, trader investor summit uh, speech when I crossed hundred K in profits. The last thing I said was that kind of on this topic of like, you tend to talk more negatively to yourself than most people would ever talk to you, right? If you made a bad trade, I doubt anyone's gonna be like, you're an idiot. You should stop trading. Like no one's gonna, if you have something like that, then don't, don't talk to them about trading. <laughs> yeah. You know, but so many people are like, you're so dumb. Like, and they're saying it to themselves. That's beating yourself up for no reason. That will literally never help you. Um, the beating myself up that I do comes from a standpoint of like, you can do better. Like you're better than how you traded today. Um, so I may be like, yeah, that was a terrible trade plan. That's some good, but why? Right. Or what, what did, or didn't I do as to why I'm not happy with that and how could I improve to be better? So yeah, I am tough on myself. Some people would say maybe I'm being hard or beating up myself, but it's very from a constructive standpoint and a very, um, improvable situation, right? It's not this, it's really, it's not an, it's not an emotional beating myself up. It's a logical of like, what did I do wrong? What did I do right? Not an emotional, you're an idiot. Well, what does that mean? You're an idiot. Like, let's, let's dive deeper into that, you know, because most times you're gonna find yourself, okay, I'm not dumb. I just did something wrong and I can, I can fix that. I can improve on that. Um, so yeah, that's the difference. I love that you said that because it's, you're asking yourself questions to mm-hmm. find out the reason and to so- make a solution so you don't do it again. And, mm-hmm. but you also, like you said, that you're not beating yourself up to just humiliate yourself. And if you have friends like that, you probably shouldn't have friends yeah, like that. Shouldn't be friend. <laughs> yeah, 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 shouldn't be your friend. Um, you also said something about the whole idea of, um, oh man, I don't think you said this, but it made me come. It made me think about at some point in your in your training career, since you've been trading for four years. Yeah, you mentioned four years. You've been trading. Has your idea of trading changed in terms of you know? At some point, I don't know if you thought this way, but like for example, me. Like I used to think trading was you know, learn a pattern and you can trade, right? But now I personally think that it's so odd. I think it's so difficult to explain, but it's like trading is really, really unique to each person. Like everyone trades very different is what I've started to learn over time. But has your philosophy of trading like that, a view of it, has it changed? What was it before? What is it now? Or has it always been the same? Um, hmm. I think in terms of how I handle trading, like when I'm at my screens, when I'm in the office or I'm working on a trading or trading in general, that's kind of been the same. Like I, I know I'm, I'm sticking to a setup. I have a process. This is how I like to think. This is how I like to feel in terms of being emotional or calm or focused. I feel like that's always stayed the same. Um, what's changed a lot is as I have gotten bigger size, as I have, I have taken bigger losses, bigger gains, grown my account much, much bigger. Uh, what's changed mentally is the perspective of just money in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's very, I think a lot of traders who get big or who start making a lot of money might have this issue or relate to what I'm saying in that each level can kind of take you further and away from the norm. And I'm not saying the norm is good or bad, but like, again, from 80 to 90% of the population, you have a salary, you have this, you have that. And that's how most people live. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you enter trading, like you said, it just, it, you enter this whole other world of possibility in a way. Um, so like I have, you have to just, so like I said, like if I'm risking a thousand bucks, I have to re- either remind myself or forget depending on how, how I want to look at it, 
that like a thousand bucks can buy me this, can buy me that. It can, it can do this for somebody, can do that for myself. So it's, it's very like one. So when I crossed, um, when I crossed $2 million in profits, um, I took a bunch of friends out and I told myself like, we're celebrating for this. They don't know it yet, but I'm going to, I'm going to pay for the whole dinner. And I didn't really have any expectations for how much I was going to spend, but we got drinks. We did bowling. We did like karaoke. This whole place had like everything, uh, dinner. And the whole night was like 800 bucks. And I got the check and I was like, this is it. Like, the, and of course that's a lot of money. Like that's, that's a lot, but it, again, from a trading standpoint, like, that's not even one loss. <laughs> so it, it's, it, that, that, that perspective, um, I constantly have to keep reminding myself or like when I, when I lost 90 grand on MMNFF, I was like, that's a Tesla. I could have just bought in a Tesla cash right there, you know? Um, so that kind of stuff, like I have to constantly just keep, a. I wouldn't say level head. I would just say perspective, just constantly know how much things are. Don't lose, don't lose sight of what the real world actually is and how grateful we are to make kind of have even the opportunity to kind of make the money that you can make in these markets, given enough experience, enough work, enough time, you know, enough effort. So, yeah. What, what do you feel like is the most common question you get asked nowadays with a, like a, so with a trader dealing with a certain challenge? Oh, like just, yeah, most questions, like most challenging yeah. that people like go when people ask you a question, like on DMs, like what do you feel like is the most common question around a, around a common challenge that they're facing? Right. Um, right now specifically is adapting to the market. Because uh, I think how the market usually goes when people have been around long enough, the summers are slow. You're right. The summers are many traders going on vacation. I mean, selling may and go away, you know, um, stuff like that. So, and I think in 2020, we didn't really have that. Like COVID, that was yeah. the peak of it all. So we really had a, just a full on year of just really no break um, of, of action. And so a lot of traders I know that have been trading for the last one or two years haven't seen a summer like this. And this summer is started to look like and remind me of 2019 mm -hmm. um, summer where 2018 was way, way slower. This summer market could be way, way slower. Um, but 2018, I remember, I mean, days on end of not even taking a trade, not even finding a trade. Um, and so I've had a lot of traders reach out to me and be like, Hey, I'm not adapting. Well, you know, there's my setups aren't showing up. Like, are they ever going to come back and this and that? And I always say like, just wait, right? Like in 2018, the panic dip by that I referred to, you know, back, like they were, there were none. And I was like, Oh my gosh, is this setup gone? And they came back. Right. So I'm not saying they always come back, but there is a, there is a cycle or a cyclical beauty to the markets. And we're just not in as, you know, and plus in, in January and February, we got more spoiled than we've ever been. Like I've seen people compare it to the dot com boom. Like I didn't, I wasn't, I was only like four years old during the dot com boom. <laughs> but people who've traded it are like this. This resembles it a lot. I've heard a lot of people say that. Um, so we were spoiled. Now we're not slow. We're slower, but more of a regular kind of market. Um, mm -hmm. And so people aren't adapting well. And I think that's the biggest struggle they get. And I always tell them, you just have to ride it out. Like you have to learn to adapt. Like I said, whether that means taking less size, taking less risk taking time off. Um, did you struggle with having, adapting at the beginning? Say it again. Did you struggle at adapting in the beginning of your trading? Yeah. Yeah. When I, so 2018, even though I was, I was at the end of 2019, I was up over hundred K in hindsight, that was still very, very early for me. It didn't feel early, early at the time. Um, but the reason why I say it was early was because back then I rarely ever traded NASDAQs, rarely ever traded list of stocks. It was almost all OTC. Okay. When 2018, I'm referring, it was so slow. I was referring, I'm mainly referring to the OTC market, like the panic dip buys were not happening. I thought they were gone. Um, I had to adapt to list it. Like I had to learn it. And so by the end of 2018, and then I it almost was perfect timing. By the time kind of COVID hit and all these NASDAQ COVID going to create a vaccine, save the world, <laughs> runners started popping up. That's really when I got a hang of listed. Um, and I'm so grateful for that because if I hadn't, I, I just would not have adapted and learned NASDAQs and I would not be trading them as well as I do trade now. Um, so yeah, yeah. When you adapted and switched to NASDAQ, what, what did you, did you like do anything different? Like, what did you do to adapt? Like, did you downsize? Did you keep like, what did you do? Um, yeah. First thing was downsize any, any new setup, whether no matter what market I want to trade smaller size to just, just learn, uh, not even make profit. The give perspective that's, that's what you home. mean by downsize to give other people's perspective. perspective so we'll go, that. let's go back to that thousand dollar example. Yeah. Um, I might move it down to like a hundred. I mean, really just 80, 90% yeah. down because it's like, I, I don't, again, I, the goal isn't to make money. The goal is for me to learn how to handle 
this particular setup. Of course, now once I get it, I can go right back to a thousand. Like once once you really feel comfortable, you can move the size right back up. But starting with that size is just super. It, it's there's there's emotionality behind how much money you're risking, and then emotionality behind how well you even know the setup. So if you're taking already max size, and it's with a new setup that you have no conviction or are still learning. I have a very hard time thinking you'll ever be profitable with that. I mean, some people do, I get it, but it's so much easier if you start, if you remove one of the emotionalities, which is emotionality of like too much risk. So you can deal with the emotionality of a new setup, learn it, and then, then get, then tackle the other emotionality side of it. Um, so size down that way, 90%, I would just take a hundred dollar risk at that point. And then the way I approached it was I tried to find a setup that I was already trading in the OTC market that resembled in the NASDAQ market. So for me, it was the first red day, right? OTCs yeah. that have run four or five days in a row of hundred percent and then have a huge red day of 10, 20%. And I'd make that, that move. Um, they happen to list it. They happen different, right? There's different characteristics. There's different movements in, in any one minute, but there's still the same psychological move there where any one runner can run up two or 300%. The framework. Yes. Right. And so once I knew under, under knew and understood that, that was my plan of attack. Um, and even to this day, that is still probably mean the majority NASDAQ trading setup I have. I mean, I don't long listed. That's the one part area that I have adapted the least to, which is longing listed. Um, mainly because I haven't necessarily had to, but granted, you know, if I wanted, I, my, my goal for me is to trade 20, 30 years. So I'm sure at some point I will reach a point where I might need to go that route. Um, but for right now, I'm just really bad at it. But whenever I need to learn it, um, I will happily size down, happily, you know, try to maybe do a breakout or a dip buy unlisted. There's some, there are some, some listed dip buys that I've had made money on. Um, but it, just an average one or like a, you know, I'm not good at it. So that's my, that's my least, my weakest area of the market that I might have to adapt to in the coming future. We'll see. So, so everyone listening, you need to rewind that because he literally said with a thousand dollar example, like 10 times, divide that by 10. You know, mm-hmm. like divide that by 10 to try some. And you hit something that no one's ever explained on my show before. I ever said it this way, which mm-hmm. I really like that you said it. And it's, you can deal with the, I think you said the mental, the struggle because of not knowing the actual mm-hmm. strategy. So like there's a mental side of that strategy that you got to deal with. And yep. then there's the money side of that strategy you got to deal with. And mm-hmm. I think you got to at least lower one of those, right? So that everyone's probably thinking I'm going to do the other. <laughs> you got to lower one of those. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think that's really beautifully said because a lot of us don't know that, like we don't think about that. And we just like want to size in, you know, we're eager. We want to rush. We want to get there quick. And everyone listening, I mean, I didn't even know, by the way, awesome, dude, congrats. I didn't know you crossed 2 million. That's oh, awesome. Thank you. I'm yeah, super yeah. late, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, four years and you know, it's took, it's taking you time. And what's, what's unique about that. I think it took you what, two and a half, three years to really get, cons- like really start seeing growth, but then you start yeah, to yeah. grow. Right. Mm-hmm. And so um, like, Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. I was gonna say, so like everyone listening, like it may take you three years. It may take maybe you're in your fifth year, and you're like, man, I'm so struggling. But once you get it, it doesn't take long to actually start to grow because then you can actually compound your success, and mm-hmm. that's literally what Kyle has done. And I appreciate you sharing uh, just your journey so far. And I want to ask you something, and if you want to say something before you answer, that's totally fine. But I wanted to ask you now. I think I've asked you this before, but I want to ask you now because now you're different where you are today. Looking back, what would you do different in terms of to now everyone asks me this question? I truly don't see the point of this because you don't want to rush. Because if you rush, you just you're not gonna mess up. But mm-hmm. if there was something you could do to speed it up, what would have been what would you have done? Mm, okay. So yeah, we'll do three points then because I'll answer your question. And then as you were talking, I had two things I thought in my head of right, those two things: the emotionality of, of money and the motion of new setup only one you really can control in the beginning. And that's money. You can risk less. You can't gain your experience quickly, right? That takes time. So that's why you should control the one you can more, more. And then as time grows, as experience grows, you then can control what setup you're more comfortable with and so forth. Um, uh, second thing, right. To, I guess, yeah, it's been so long to give you the time frame. Um, four and a half years in. So January, I crossed, I crossed a million in January, late January, which is about four and a half years um, and then end of June was my fifth year anniversary. Um, and then you, you briefly mentioned it talking about how, once you get your process down, you can cut, compound it and you really start to make a lot of money, right? The first hundred K was slower than the second hundred K. 
And, and I didn't, I, I knew that was the, how it goes, but until it happened, then it like hit me because it took me four and a half years to make the first million. Um, and then only took me four and a half months to make the second million. Right. Um, which yeah, I, that's I, mind blowing. No, 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 no. like, I'm still, it's still hitting me. Like I just, it's insane. And so will it take, will it take me four and a half weeks to make a third million? No, four and a <laughs> week is already, four and a half weeks is already passed. Like that's not, there's, there's obviously a, a more slower parabolic, maybe in turn, in other office, you need a hot market. Like I took advantage of the hot market we had. Um, but yeah, so now I'm at like just over four years in or five years in. Um, so yeah, it just, it, it, it definitely compounds itself. The more you have and the more experience you have. Um, to your question about well, yeah, maybe speed it up in the beginning. Um, my biggest mistake when I first started out was that I did not study or learn or try to learn at all for the first two or three months, which is probably the most important. Like, of course, the first year is more important than the second year in terms of getting a base education and really learning how to trade the markets. But the first three months, I mean, I, you know nothing. So if, if, you're, like, if you were like me, you know nothing um, or very, very little. And I remember just kind of starting to trade with very, I mean, nothing. I mean, I, I watched like a couple hours of, of education and I was like, eh, let's just start trading. Uh, and that led to me losing 20, 30% of my account within two or three weeks. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, luckily I immediately slowed that down. I immediately put on the brakes and started like studying and taking more seriously, but it wasn't until like three or four months in that I really took it like a business where I was like, I'm putting, I'm going to put a lot side six, eight, 10, um, one month I didn't see outside cause I literally was inside all day trading or studying. Um, now I can't do that all the time. Like I don't want to do that all the time. That's not the goal of trading. Right. But I wish earlier on, I saw the value in that because mm-hmm. I maybe could have started my learning curve a little bit sooner or a little bit, maybe more efficient than blowing money away initially. And maybe that's what, and, and in hindsight, you know, maybe that's what got me to do, do that. But again, everyone's journey is different. But for me, it's like, if I could have gone back, I could tell the younger Kyle, like study first, you know, study more first earlier on. Cause it wasn't until a few months in that I actually took studying as a priority over trading. Um, and so that definitely hurt me in the beginning for sure. You said treat it like a business too. And mm-hmm. I think, I love that you said that because it, until I started thinking that way, I, I was struggling. Like I was struggling yeah. for a while. Cause I would just take it personally. I, I would like play with the money instead of actually treating it. Like it was mm-hmm. a company yep. as if, this is to actually grow for my family, you know, like, is, you know, this is a job, a business. I think I love that you said that because a lot of people, that's going to help a lot of people. They might be treating it like it's a, a fun thing mm-hmm. rather than a business. And then I, I want to ask you this though, because you said you wish you wish you would have done that sooner. So maybe you wouldn't have that drawdown at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. And that made me think of a lot of people who have a drawdown right now and they might have, they might have been trading for four years and they're still not getting it. Maybe they're taking a couple of small accounts have blown up, but that adds up. Right. And then mm-hmm. I feel like there's something to be said about PTSD and trading. Mm. And they've, they, maybe they finally have found what works for them, but they're still dealing with what has happened in the past. I don't know if you can, if you can relate, but if you can, can you, can you share anything that maybe any advice on how to deal with, man, you know what, Kyle, I, I know it works for me now. I'm doing well. I'm consistent for this whole year, but I'm trading really small and I'm scared to size up because I lost so much in the beginning. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 Um, I think in a way back to the very beginning of the episode where we talked about how I've, I can get very timid very quickly and like really size down. I think in some ways that that has helped me adapt to the market's better. So I haven't had, I would say maybe as much as PTSD as some traders do if they did take a big loss, because I've always been just on the more timid side yes. um, where I have kind of avoided very psychologically damaging like losses or trades. Um, I would say a lot of PTSD I get, I come, I, any, any time of like scarring or like, you could, we're talking like throughout therapy here, but um, usually it'll happen. I'll compartmentalize it down to like tickers individual tickers where if like a ticker is just such a pain in the butt, I, I, I can't read its pricing at all. I've taken loss after loss after loss. I'll blacklist it. I'd be like, I can't read this. It gives, it makes me start sweating just even looking at things or even thinking about taking a trade. We're going to blacklist it. Like no, no trading it. We're done. We're not even going to look at it. Um, that's one way I remove kind of maybe smaller, mm. you know, little, little uh, yeah. emotionalities about it. Um, but maybe a bigger one, I, I can't say I've had one. Um, 
one that one trader that does come up to mind is Huddy, uh, Michael Hudson. Um, he we've talked about this because he's a good he's a good buddy of mine um, in terms of the trading community. Earlier on in his career, he was very very aggressive, and it worked out really really well because he was one of the first earlier students that at least I knew of that I kind of grew, grew or was attracted to that really made two or three hundred k relatively quickly in his career. Yep. Um, but then I remember he took a few losses, like two, a couple of five bigger losses being too aggressive, right? The market changed, however it happened. And that was two or three years ago. That was like 2018, 2019. Now when 2020 came around, when 2021 came around and the market was super hot, um, other traders like myself, Matt Monaco, Jack, we hadn't had that traumatic kind of losses or yet. Um, and so we really pushed it. Mm. Whereas Huddy did push it. He'd made more money than he's ever had before in his career, which was great. But he, we had this conversation. He told me, he was like, I didn't push it as hard as I knew I could have because I've had that scarring earlier on. Um, and as to how he solved it, I, I don't necessarily know. He's definitely much better now. He definitely takes much bigger size and knows how to be aggressive. Um, I would say it's just time, you know, well, first recognizing it, recognizing me what specific aspect that made you, or that gives you that PTSD or gives you that scarring. Um, and the same way I said, we talked about like not beating yourself up, like try to ask yourself questions. Like, why is it that this, why is it this, this way? What about this can I maybe remove or, or recover from or heal from? Uh, and then I think it's just time, like anything, like any, any, even outside the trading, like any, any emotionally damaging experience can always be at least improved with time. Um, yeah. and obviously conscious effort to, to improve that as well. So I appreciate that. And everyone listening, he said, Mike Huddy, uh, if you're curious who that is, he's actually been on the show before. So you can, mm-hmm. I'll put a link below. You can watch his episode and I'll put Kyle's previous interviews below too. So that way you're like, who the heck is Kyle? Like, <laughs> so you'll know more about Kyle too, because we did a whole bio of like who he is, where he, where he got him started. And so for today is just catching up. I, I want to ask you something, man, what, what are you looking forward to now? Like what, what's your goal in trading? Like what, what, what's the goal for you? Um, so I feel like instinctually, a lot of people have like a money or a number, like how much do you want to make? And I'll do, I, although I do have like goals, like it'd be cool to make 10 million, you know, cool to make 20, but then, but again, it's not about the money. Like it, that could take, that could take 10 years. That could take five years. That could take 20 years. Um, it's really like the game. I love the game of trading, you know? Um, and so, yeah, it's beneficial that I've made a decent amount of money, a solid amount of money to where I don't necessarily have to work now, at least for a few years. Like I can a little more control my time and how I want to spend it. Um, but even if I wasn't as that successful earlier on or as early as in my career as maybe I've, I've seen it, I would still be trading the same way. Um, Cause I just, I love the game. Um, in terms of maybe other goals besides just trading, um, I definitely like taking, I recently as, as COVID has lightened up, I definitely have taken advantage of maybe traveling and trading. I really enjoy that. I understand from a perspective, like once I have a wife, once I have kids, once I have a dog, like that, that responsibility will Im- immensely increase and I won't be able to travel and do things and be more, more free spirited. Um, so I definitely want to travel more, um, for the next two, three, four or five years until I hunker down and actually like have those responsibilities. Um, but yeah, big, big picture. And again, I, you know, life is so long. I'm, I imagine five, 10 years now, something else will come up, some other project and I'll fall in love with it. But right now it's like the longer term goal of 10, 20, 30 years, um, being part of this game, be a part of these markets, uh, and trading. Yeah. Awesome, man. And, and is there, is there been a time before we start to wrap this up? I just want to ask you one more thing. Is there, is there been a time where maybe a personal friend of yours, maybe someone you're close to, not in the trading world, right? Just mm-hmm. someone you're close to that you've tried to help with trading and maybe were successful with it or what maybe you weren't. If you weren't, why was that? And if you were, you know, what challenge were they facing to help before they were able to get it? Mm-hmm. Uh, this is such an interesting topic. And I, and I think about this all the time. I had, I had a conversation with this. Uh, I don't know who, it was another trader, but we talked about this specific thing of like people outside the trading world, friends, family who maybe are interested, but haven't taken that leap. And they come to you for guidance. Cause I do have a friend like that. Yeah. Um, and he, he's, he's started studying a little bit. He started watching some videos, started looking into it. Um, but as to whether he's going to really commit to it, I don't know yet. 
and I've, and I've learned to not force it upon them. Right. Cause it's, it's like, it's, it's draining. It's not, you know, cause I think naturally as, as traders who, who see the end of the tunnel, like to see the, see how, how much potential trading can bring and how much like satisfaction it brings to be a profitable trader and kind of like make a living for the markets. It's very, very rewarding once you get there. Um, so like instinctually, I think we want to be like, Oh, you should do this. Like, like, I want you to feel how I feel, you know? Um, I've learned to kind of let people who want to do it come to you, right? If they really want to do it, they'll show you and they'll come to me they'll come to you and then really show an effort like, Hey, I want to learn. Um, anytime I feel like I need to like, Hey, have you, you want to study together or, Hey, you want to learn this with me? And they don't, it just, it's a waste of my energy. It's a waste of their time, waste of my time. Um, so I haven't had too many people do that. And I've talked, and again, I mentioned my, the, I mentioned, I think about this topic all the time because, right. I think about my close friends, they know my success. Like they know how, how well I've done so far. Um, and I'm wondering, right. And I think about it, like, why haven't they reached out? And again, and many people are different. It's not like everyone wants to be a trader. Right. But the, my friends are smart enough that they could do it if they wanted to. Yeah. Um, and they've got my guidance to help them, but they just, they're on their own career paths or doing their own things. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it just, and from a psychological standpoint, it definitely makes me think of like how unique everyone is and who really does and doesn't want to start or even not even trade, but even start, even have that interest in trading. Cause some people just don't, they're like, eh, he's made this much money, but it's not for me. It's like, you haven't tried it yet, you know, yeah. but to each their own. It's like, it's, yeah. I, again, they got to come to me. They got to show me they want it. Cause otherwise I'm not, I, I just don't want to waste anyone's energy and force it upon anyone who doesn't want to do it. Yeah. You know? So that makes sense. Well, well, Kyle, where can everyone, if they want to ask you questions, if they want to learn more about you, how can they find out more about you? Where should they go? Um, so I have a lot of YouTube videos um, from just, I'll put out monthly recaps. So I didn't, unfortunately didn't get one to in August. Cause I just moved into this new place. been super, super busy, but um, YouTube has all these old videos of my journey. Um, Twitter. I post a lot of trading stuff. Um, I have Instagram. It's not really much for trading, but if you, I usually can pick up on my DMs in, on Instagram better than on Twitter. Um, so for questions or whatever, that that works too. Um, but yeah, just those those three main social medias are always always good. Okay, and I'll have his Twitter on the link below in the description, so you guys can easily click on that and find him right away. But again, Kyle, thank you so much for being here, my man. It was a pleasure, brother. Hey, thanks for having me on, man. This is good.